Great. Thanks very much. All right. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, uh, depending on where you are in the, in the country or in the world. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we're on today. And I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land and reaffirm our commitment and responsibility to improving relations between nations and improving our own understanding of Indigenous peoples and their cultures. We acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home. Tomorrow is the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation here in Canada, and I'd particularly like to draw attention to the Truth and Reconciliation Report. And remember the at least 150,000 First Nations, Métis, and Inuit children who were forced through the residential school system from 1883 to the 1990s. As late as 1941 to 45, the residential school death rate was 4.9 times higher than the general death rate. According to the Truth and Reconciliation Report, for children, life in these schools was lonely and alien. Buildings were poorly located, poorly built, and poorly maintained. Discipline was harsh and daily life was highly regimented. Child neglect was institutionalized and the lack of supervision created situations where students were prey to sexual and physical abusers. Please join me for a moment of reflection to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and to consider how we can each in our own way try to move forward in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Among these many harms and injustices, of course, is the colonial nature of the global economy and the colonial roots of the world trading system, which we're going to be discussing today. To begin with, I'd like to introduce myself and the other editors of the book. I am Gavin Friedel, Canada Research Chair in International Development Studies at St. Mary's University, and I've worked, written about, and studied fair trade for many years. I'm joined by my two co-editors, Zach Gross, who has spent a long career in the international development NGO community in Canada. Zach facilitates courses in international development at the University of British Columbia, is a member of Fair Trade Canada's Board of Directors, and is board chair of the Marquee Project, a Manitoba-based NGO. He has also been awarded the Queen's Golden Jubilee Medal and Fair Trade Canada's Lifetime Achievement Award. The other co-editor is Sean McHugh. He is the founder and executive director of the Canadian Fair Trade Network. Sean has led the national effort to build out a more robust, organized social movement across Canada since 2011. And this has included building out the Fair Trade Town and Campus programs and launching new programs such as Fair Trade Schools, Workplaces, Events, and Faith Groups. Coordinating eight national conferences held across the country, publishing 14 editions of the Fair Trade magazine, and co leading trips to origin. So, the book itself emerged out of a range of discussions carried out at the annual meetings of the Canadian Fair Trade Network over the years. In putting the book together, we've sought to assemble a range of voices on fair trade, including those working in fair trade organizations, those advocating for trade justice, broadly understood, and those who do work exposing the injustices in the global trading system. As a social movement and solidarity network, fair trade has the potential to change how we source many of the products that are central to our everyday lives and how this sourcing impacts people through global supply chains. It can do this by building partnerships based on understanding, dignity, cooperation, and solidarity, ensuring baseline standards and prices above what often counts as the norm in international trade relations, and it can change how we do business and how we trade as countries. At the same time, fair trade is far from perfect. Thus far, it has limited reach and impact compared to the overwhelming weight of the global economy. Despite much talk to the contrary, the general norm in global supply chains is still to push down working conditions and step up environmental degradation for the sake of increased profits. Fair trade works as a counter to this norm, driven in particular by the hard work and energy of thousands of people who continue to push fair trade forward, responding to the limitations and the challenges, and constantly improving and adapting. It's a process of change driven by farmers and workers, co-ops, certifiers, dedicated companies, institutions, and advocates. This book is an effort to bring forward voices and perspective from these various actors with different views on what fair trade involves to continue to help drive the process forward. 
We'll be posting information on the book and how to get it. And we have arranged for some great local booksellers to have the book available, in my case, at the bookmark in Halifax. I'd like to thank everyone. at Fernwood for their support. So today, for the virtual launch, we're going to take turns introducing you to three contributors of the book, each of whom represents a key theme. Each of us, as editors, will take a few minutes to discuss the theme before handing it over to the contributors. In the second half, we'll have time for questions and answers. I'd also add that this event today is one of, among others, that are planned with other authors in the book, uh, in the coming months, including the Maritime launch on October 1st at St. Mary's University. So to kick things off, I'm going to hand things over to Zach Gross. Zach? OK, thanks, Gavin. Uh, first of all, as the person who keeps being credited with the idea of this handbook project, I want to pay tribute to my co-author, co-editors, Gavin and Sean, who brought incredible information, energy, and skill to this effort. I did my best to keep up with them. Over the two plus years duration of producing this book, we've faced COVID, plus a new baby for Sean and Marianne, heart surgery for me, and many more challenges, but we've endured and remained good friends. And my thanks to the authors for their hard work on their chapters, all done as volunteers, and to those who were responsible for photos, the cover, editing, and the index and to Fernwood for taking on this project and bringing it to fruition. My feeling when we embarked on the Fair Trade Handbook project was that it could be the next big thing in the fair trade community. As COVID derailed some of our more public activities like our national conference and many of our face-to-face -face programs, meetings and consultations that potentially could take place every day across Canada, I believe that the book has become even more important to us. We hope that the Fair Trade Handbook will prove worthy of being at least one of the next big things in fair trade. I found in my years involved in fair trade that our community is capable and energetic, warm and cooperative, supportive and celebratory. This book writing and editing project has been another example of what we can accomplish together. Hopefully, the book and its many spin off activities will impact consumer behavior and government and corporate policy so that our partners in the Global South will experience the benefit of improved income and have more power in the global marketplace. My own career goal in international development and in fair trade has been, has been to spend the past half century in what we used to call the belly of the beast. That is working here in the Global North with educational institutions, faith-based groups, business people, and the public at large in our rich world to engage them in learning about the causes of disparities on our planet, in our economic, social, and environmental lives, and to encourage and mobilize them to take positive, concrete action to bring about change. I've tried to share some of my experiences in the chapter in the handbook, Taking Fair Trade to the People. A barrier to consumer action and political change has been a lack of knowledge and lack of sensitivity to the impact of colonialism and neocolonialism through the past 500 years or so. As a lifelong student of history, I'm often dismayed by how little people know of our past and how it has impacted marginalized groups and individuals. As a part-time academic, I am disappointed in how little history our post-secondary students have studied or explored. I find that in teaching international development studies, I also have to teach history and show how what has happened in the past has created or exacerbated the issues we face today. On this day before National Day for Truth and Reconciliation in Canada, I think our Fair Trade Handbook makes a strong statement on the impact of colonialism in past centuries and today through our Western European culture, through conflict, trade, aid, tourism, debt repayment requirements, and many other means with which we perpetuate poverty and human rights violations. 
A major theme in my teaching and in my NGO work and in delivering engagement programs in fair trade has been to focus on the impact of colonialism. Yet I was still blown away when I first read Haroon Akram Lodi's chapter in our book, How Unfair Trade Changed the World. First of all, I have to say that we give Haroon extra points because it made us feel like things were going to actually happen. But the chapter is passionate and an, an, an informational, um, historical look at the damage that has been wrought in the name of wealth accumulation. And I have to say that it was not the only chapter that have brought a tear to my eye and renewed my resolve to work on these issues. Haroon is a professor of economics and international development studies at Trent University in Peterborough, Ontario, specializing in agrarian political economy, and he's also editor-in-chief of the Canadian Journal of Development Studies. It's my privilege now to introduce him and call on him to make remarks. Thanks. Well, thanks very much, Zach. Um, first of all, of course, I want to congratulate Gavin, Zach, and Sean for shepherding the Fair Trade Handbook to this launch. Two and a half years, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of time. The Fair Trade Handbook has been, in my view, a big and complex project, but one that the three of them have always approached with good humor and with grace. And it's been a real pleasure to take part in this process. I also want to congratulate the other contributors to the volume, some of whom I know, and many of whom I do not, for seeing this through to the end. Which is where we're now at, at the end of the beginning of the life of the book, a book which, as Gavin has indicated, uh, there are great ambitions for. So in the few minutes that I have, I want to say a few things about my chapter, Colonialism, How Unfair Trade Changed the World. As Gavin has already noted in his remarks, tomorrow is Canada's first ever National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. And I think that this is an especially poignant time to comment upon the colonial project. That's because colonialism has shaped the trajectory of global development since the 15th century profoundly reconfiguring the lives and livelihoods of pretty well everyone on the planet, including, of course, Canada's indigenous peoples. As I say in the chapter, colonialism was very broadly guided by four principles, can be divided into two long-term ta time periods, and encompass three forms of colonial states. But underneath this diversity were five common mechanisms of colonial resource extraction. First, there was violence. Colonialism was built upon genocidal violence against the colonized. Hosea Jaffe has estimated that between 1500 and 1900, some 500 million people died as a result of the guns, germs, and steel brought by colonialism. Second, there's property. Colonialism globalized the idea of private property, particularly of the elites, something which is historically very recent as an idea. Where populations were killed, lands became empty to be claimed by, as private property by colonial elites. To work those lands, colonizers enslaved millions, claiming that those human beings were also property. Thirdly then, there was labor. Beyond the ravages of enslavement, colonialism depressed wage payments in the colonies, and together this sustained rising profits for colonial merchant companies and shareholders in the colonial power. At the same time, when enslaved peoples were liberated, enslavers were compensated for the loss of their property at market values. In Britain, paying for this compensation was not finally completed until as recently as 2015. Fourth, there's trade. International trade between the colonies and the colonizers were rigged in order to increase the profits that accrued to the trading companies and manufacturers in the colonizers, effectively creating underdevelopment. And then finally, fifthly, tax. Highly regressive tax systems in the colonies dragged people into rigged markets in order to meet the tax demands placed upon them. As a, as a result of these mechanisms of resource extraction, colonialism brought huge financial benefits to the colonizers. But no one has been able to provide definitive estimates of the value of the colonies to the colonizers. 
Most recently, the famous future Nobel Prize winning economist Thomas Piketty has tried to make some estimates of the value of colonies to the colonizers in his recent book, Capital and Ideology. Others have tried to do the same. My friend Utsa Patnaik has been working on this for decades, and she is a very thorough and very methodical radical economist. Professor Patnaik has estimated that between 1765 and 1938, $45 trillion was transferred from British India to the United Kingdom. Now think about that figure for a moment, $45 trillion. That is 17 times the United Kingdom's gross domestic product for 2020. 17 times the value of everything that was produced in the UK for one year. That's the value of what was extracted from British India only to the UK. Colonialism was the basis by which the powerful and the powerful countries of today seized control of the world's resources and set up the rules that continue to shape the way the world works. So colonialism is the foundation of our contemporary unequal and unjust world. Once again, congratulations to Gavin, Zach and Sean for the book and thanks for this opportunity to contribute to the launch. Thanks very much, Arun, uh, for your contribution to the book, which is such a wonderful uh, contribution. And to Zach as well, thanks for both of you for such powerful commentary. Um, I'm now uh, going to introduce Roxana, and I'm going to hook it to something that builds off what Haroon was already introducing us to, which is another current that cuts through the book, and that is global inequality. So as you would imagine after uh, hearing Haroon, we do live in a world of immense wealth and immense inequality, and these inequalities uh, only tend to get worse, especially during these times we're now living in of a global pandemic. Uh, this is perhaps best symbolized, as we pointed in the book, uh, by the example of Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, who has increased his personal wealth by tens of billions of dollars just during the pandemic year alone. He's now the richest person in history, worth around $200 billion. The injustices caused by global inequality are reflected in many chapters in the book that explore how this plays out around gender, race, nationality, class, and unequal exposure to the impacts of climate crisis. One theme I'm going to address in my very brief time here is the, the issue of price. Prices, both low prices and unpredictable prices, are amongst the most significant reflections of inequality in the world trading system. To put it very simply, many of the basic products that we consume every day in the north or in the south are produced by farmers and workers who are not paid a fair price. Prices are often below the cost of living, and prices do not pay for the hard work and knowledge that so many farmers around the world pour into their farms as stewards of the land, growing food in agroecological and sustainable ways that they are not compensated for. Now, higher prices alone will not solve all of the social and ecological challenges in the world trading system. However, I always think it's important to emphasize price because it is so often neglected in corporate social responsibility. Corporations have proven willing to create all kinds of rules and regulations that they expect producers uh, further down the chain to uh, adhere to. But they are rarely willing to offer a guaranteed price, high enough to pay for the work and knowledge that goes into producing those goods in a sustainable way. Price is key to global justice, which is why fair trade offers a minimum floor price, and the small producer symbol offers an even higher guaranteed price. There are many injustices embedded in prices, and there's, these injustices, for example, are embedded in a coffee bean price. According to Oxfam report in 2017, Kenyan coffee farmers earn about 53% of a living income. Now, to get their income up to a living income, Oxfam estimates an additional 2% is needed to be added to the final price of coffee. So this means that a $2 cup of coffee needs to only cost $2.04 to provide a living income for the farmer, as long as that extra four cents makes its way to the farmer. Today, uh, coffee prices are on the rise globally after over a decade of very low coffee prices. However, this increase has been driven by major troubles in the industry, 
There's been a major drought followed by a major frost in Brazil. And of course, there's been COVID-19, which has led to reduced trade flows and higher freight costs in particular. So this means that after years and years of terribly low prices, coffee prices have only risen now when millions of coffee farmers and workers find themselves confronting other crises. Unfair and unpredictable prices are linked to the real lived experiences of people throughout the world in many ways. One tragic story is told in a chapter by Roxana Oliveira, who is with us here today. Roxana is an investigative journalist who has published widely in many venues, including the CBC, Huffington Post, El País, and the New Internationalist. She won the Journalist in Residence Fellowship from Osgoode Hall Law School from 2017 to 2019, and among other awards, was a recipient of the prestigious Al Newharth Innovation in Investigative Journalism Award for her joint work with the International Consortium of Investigative Journalism on, global, on a global investigation into forced evictions financed by the World Bank. I will now pass things along to Roxana for her to tell us about her investigative work into the life of Alvaro Vargas Fonseca. Roxana, thanks for joining us. And uh, you're on mute still, Roxana. Sorry about that. Okay. Thank you, Gavin. Thank you very much, Gavin, and everyone for joining us today. When we drink coffee, most of us never think of the farmers who planted, harvested, dried, and roasted those coffee beans that go into our morning cup. I must confess that I, for one, had never thought about them until I became a acquainted with the story, tragic story of Alvaro Vargas Fonseca. According to a newspaper article published in 2008, Alvaro died at a construction site here in Toronto and his landlady was having trouble getting his body. As I read the article, I began to wonder about Alvaro's life. Who was he? What brought him to Canada? Why wasn't his employer or the Costa Rican consulate or the Canadian government responsible for getting his remains to Costa Rica instead of his landlady? It was those questions that eventually took me to Costa Rica to meet his family. As I learned more about Alvaro's life, I learned that he was a coffee farmer who had never intended to leave Costa Rica. It was, as I mentioned, volatile coffee bean prices that forced him to leave for the United States and later head to Canada. Basically, global coffee bean prices are regulated and kept stable from 1963 up until 1989 by international agreement through a quota system. But with the end of that agreement in 1989, prices begin to drop and remain low until 1994. Um, in 1991, when prices are collapsing globally, Alvaro makes his first trip to the United States the country behind the end of the very quota system that had for years afforded protection to coffee farmers like him. But he's also headed to a country that happens to be the world's largest consumer of coffee. Around 1994, prices begin to recover. So Alvaro returns to Costa Rica. He thinks that the crisis is finally over, but no. Unfortunately, the recovery period does not last very long. Prices start collapsing once again around 1998, reaching an all-time low, the lowest they have been in half a century. So Alvaro um, heads in 1998, he Alvaro heads off again to the United States, but this time prices have completely collapsed. Alvaro then comes to Canada in, in 2004, sorry, during the second major coffee crisis. And sadly, when he dies in 2008, prices are just recovering. Alvaro died as an undocumented worker here in Canada, a country where among adults we drink coffee more than any other beverage, even more than water. Alvaro was just among thousands of coffee farmers who saw their lives turned upside down by the wild and unpredictable swings of coffee bean prices in the world market. His story is also tied to a broader story about unfair trade practices, involuntary migration, and death along the Mexico-US border. It is also a story about the grieving families left behind and of workers 
and volunteers with various organizations like the Colibri Project and the Missing Migrants Project left to piece together the stories of those who vanished in the desert. Since 2014, more than 4,000 people have died on the migration routes through Central America, Mexico, the Caribbean, and the United States. And according to forensic anthropologist Dr. Bruce Anderson, since 2001, the Pima County Office of the Medical Examiner in Arizona has recovered the bodies of as many as 3,081 migrants, but only 1,970 of them have actually been identified. So the questions remain, how many of those identified and unidentified migrants were coffee, markers, uh, coffee makers in that desert? Can fair trade be a possible solution to, fur to prevent further deaths? Alvaro's story is also the story of those who make it only to lead a precarious existence as undocumented workers, devoid of benefits and exposed to exploitation and reprisals, be it in Canada or in the United States. And in many ways, Alvaro's story is also a story about who we are as a nation. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Roxana. Sean, did you want to jump right in? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Um, as Gavin mentioned at the start, my name is Sean McHugh, and I'm the founder and executive director of the Canadian Fair Trade Network. Uh, when the idea of the book came up, I, uh, I loved it. However, having published 14 editions of Fairtrade Magazine, which was our biannual publication for seven years, I knew it was going to be quite the undertaking, especially, especially with such a wide range of topics and writers. While it took a ton of work, I will say that it was a pretty incredible experience to work with such an inspiring group of people. I will also say that while this book covers a lot, it could be volume one in a multi-volume series, as Fairtrade is complex, to say the least. When I first got involved with the movement, the concept seemed straightforward enough so 10 years later, there's still lots to learn. I think the complexity of fair trade is what makes this book so interesting. You have farmers and workers, you have development organizations, you have local politics, you have co-ops and exporters, you have importers, roasters, and those taking raw commodities to bring them together to make things like chocolate. You have distributors, you have food service companies, you have retailers. And on top of that, you have an entire social movement driven by advocates, volunteers, and people at municipalities, universities, and schools who are working to change policies and purchasing at their respective institutions. It's incredible to see, and it's an exciting movement to be part of. On that note, it's my pleasure to introduce Monica Furl. Monica is the Director of Sustainability at Co-op Coffees and someone I've known for many, many years. Monica's depth and understanding of fair trade go be goes beyond almost anyone I've ever met. She has decades of experience and has a wealth of knowledge. She also brings an unmatched passion to this movement. Monica also brings an incredible breadth of knowledge as well, having been involved in multiple aspects of this movement with her engagement with the social movement, involvement with business, co-ops and coffee, and perhaps most importantly, her on the ground involvement around the world. Monica and I, and I have attended conferences and trade shows together and been on various panels and calls over the years. And while all this has been great, I will say that Monica has a ton of fun and has been a real pleasure knowing her. In recent years, we have also we also share the feeling of urgency around climate and that, and that now is the time that we can't afford any more delays, that no more talk is needed, and that it, it is time for action. I also think that at this point that you'd have to have your head buried pretty deep in the sand to not have a general sense of the multitude of challenges that the world is facing, socially, economically, and of course, increasingly urgently, environmentally. It is safe to say that we have pushed the planet to the brink of collapse. For me, the urgency of action started with spending time in the mountains here in BC and literally watching glaciers shrink and in some cases disappear from one year to the next. What really hit home is not just the melting glaciers, but the interconnectivity of the Earth's systems. For instance, if glaciers disappear, it affects runoff. If, runners dry, if rivers dry up, then salmon don't run. If salmon don't run, then bears go hungry, etc., etc. The urgency was further driven home when the idea of our global shared carbon budget started to set in. The idea that we now know the maximum amount of CO2 that our atmosphere can handle, and we know how much gets emitted each year. With those numbers, we can understand how much time we have left to start bringing this problem under control. On this note, the urgency is ratcheted up further, knowing that the CO2 we emit stays up there until natural carbon sequestration processes like forest growth can draw it out. 
again, going back to the math, we now know how much carbon gets sequestered through natural processes. And we now know how much we emit so that we can now see we are at the balance and we are out of balance and emit way more than the planet can handle. And while we know the, that most of the issues stems from the burning of fossil fuels to largely support our energy systems and the transportation se sector, global agriculture is a contributor through land use, pesticide and fertilizer use, et cetera. It is also full of potential for change. And it is on that, on that note that I will hand things over to Monica. Thank you, Sean, for such a lovely introduction. I am flattered and humbled. And many thanks also for leading us so nicely into the climate chapter. I feel honored and grateful to have had the opportunity to contribute toward this wonderful book and to share today some of my intentions behind the chapter related to climate justice. Living in Canada with our vast resources, small population and relatively stable political, social and economic systems, many people seem to feel safe thinking that we won't be the hardest hit with climate emergencies. And yet from coast to coast to coast in Canada, we're already suffering serious consequences due to our lack of clear action. The Canadian North is warming faster than any other place on earth. And as the Arctic tundra warms, permafrost melts, releasing stored carbon and methane, a greenhouse, greenhouse gas significantly more potent than carbon dioxide and triggering a dangerous feedback loop. We're only just beginning to understand the true human and environmental risks that this represents, but we're already seeing communities indigenous to these regions facing extreme ecological hardship and precisely at a time when the world needs indigenous cultures and their practice of living in harmony with nature to grow and to flourish. So in this chapter, I've attempted to say we can do better as individuals and as a country. The average carbon footprint per capita in Canada is more than 150 times the average in many developing countries. Or in other words, the average Canadian puts out as much carbon dioxide in just two and a half days as an average Nigerian would in an entire year. And even compared to other industrialized nations, the average Canadian footprint is still more than double the G20 average. In fact, Canada is the third worst performer in per capita emissions in the world, behind only Australia and the United States. We don't have time to wait. We must change immediately. Individual gestures to lower your carbon footprint can have a significant impact. We need to think about our energy, transportation, and consumption choices but of course, we need to assure that these individual actions can also push collectively towards structural change that allows us to actually meet national emission reduction targets. As fair traders with our business values steeped in economic and social justice, we cannot ignore climate justice. We're, and we're perfectly poised for climate action. At Cooperative Coffees, we have a 20 year history of building long term and mutually beneficial relationships. We have fully embraced our mutual dependency on our producer partners success. So when they're hit with climate disaster, we also suffer. In the chapter, I explain our carbon climate and coffee initiative, which encourages roasters and our importing operation to track and reduce our CO2 emissions. Roasters uh, pay a 3%, a three cent per pound carbon tax on their green coffee purchases. And those accumulated funds are then channeled back to our producer partners to support farmer to farmer learning exchanges, soil regeneration, reforestation, and other field and farming innovation. I also describe some of the incredible lessons we've learned from the extraordinary farmers that we work with. As consumers, we can leverage change through our purchasing power. In a best case coffee supply chain scenario, from the cup of barista hands you to the fair and mutually beneficial trade relationships, coffee can be traced all the way back to a farmer who's working hard to transform his or her coffee plots into carbon sequestering fields of goodness 
And we want this to become the new normal. Together, we can mobilize industry to make coffee an important piece of the climate solution puzzle. And after our cup of coffee, let's go do the same with everything we consume. Thank you. Thanks very much, Monica. And thanks to everybody for such uh, insightful and brief presentations. Um, I'm going to hand things over to Sean now, who's going to be moderating uh, any uh, Q&A that emerges from the, from the discussion. Perfect. Yes, thanks again, everyone. Uh, and thanks, Gavin. Um, yeah, so I, uh, please, do, uh, please do post questions uh, and comments, and I will, uh, I will pick those up and uh, pass, send them back out to, to the panel here. I wonder, um, Roxana, just as a follow-up to your presentation, that uh, I'm curious if you've thought, uh, I suspect you probably have, on what you would see a solution for, uh, for say, the temporary migrant laborers in Canada or in the US. Uh, you know, if you know of any either positive or really negative examples, um, anything that comes to your mind which you'd like to see done for migrant workers in Canada? Well, uh, you're muted, uh, Roxana. Sorry, again. Um, I would say that uh, definitely changes in our trading negotiations would help um, if we have fair trade. And that would be for ones to to give opportunities to other um, to to people who come to try to migrate, so that they are, you know, they're not forced to go and have these horrendous journeys to come to the United States or to Canada. Um, then we would also need to change our laws, um, employment, labor law here in Canada and our immigration system. We, if we need them to work here, we should give them status. We have organizations like Justicia for Migrants who are helping individuals who, who are caught in a system where they don't have access to justice. And, uh, and they, they have this precarious existence, like Alvaro, for instance, you know. Um, so we need to change um, a lot of our legislation, um, immigration. So if we need workers, we give them status, just like we did in the past. Um, I'm sure um, Harun knows about this. You know, when we or we, we import labor to, to come and help the colonial system that we have had for years. Well, we need to change that. That's that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. can, uh, I'll jump in next. Um, Monica, uh, years ago, I remember writing an, uh, reading an article, actually, uh, and maybe editing the article in, uh, in an edition of Fairtrade Magazine about uh, a coffee farmer that you guys were working with in Central America. Uh, and when re leaf rust was spreading uh, throughout the region, uh, I remember seeing images of that particular farm looking healthy and, and robust with nice fresh cherries on the trees. Uh, and I was just wondering, maybe you can uh, speak to that a little bit and what that particular uh, farmer was up to uh, and how it made sure. such a difference. Yes, um, that would be Oscar Alonso, and he is also mm -hmm. featured in the chapter. He is a now become a coffee grower superstar, and I first met him in the peak of the leaf rust crisis, which was absolutely devastating across all of Central America. Um, farmers were losing 20%, 30%, 50%, some 80% of their entire harvest due to this single fungal problem. So I show up in Honduras I, and they take me out to see Oscar and surrounding his field, it is absolute devastation. You know, it's sickly skeletons of trees and you turn around and his field is green, it's lush. It is honestly the best productivity I had ever seen in more than 25 years working in coffee. And it literally just stopped me in my tracks. I worked close with organics for many, many years, and I had just never seen a contrast that was so dramatic. So of course, I want to know what his secrets are. And he starts talking mm -hmm. about what he did with his soil. And I'm like, OK, I know about a lot of practices, but no one had ever spoken about soil this way and regenerating the biological life in his soil and the kind of composting, the beneficial bacteria, instead of spraying what's actually allowed 
under organics, um, copper sulfide sprays that will kill the, the detrimental fungus, but it also kills all the beneficial bacteria, all the natural defense system on the trees themselves. So it just, farmers are paying to end up leaving themselves more vulnerable. And so instead of that, he was spraying beneficial bacteria on his, on his leaf surfaces. And all of this was being uh, constructed and cultivated on farm. So he wasn't paying outside for these kinds of remedies. And so essentially what he had done is just build up all this life and nutrition in his soil and his plants mm -hmm. and there, his plants took care of themselves. He essentially inoculated his fields to this devastating and it completely, literally changed my life forever. <laughs> and that the way I look at soil, the way I look at um, you know, ecological balance is completely shifted. And you know, that experience for us at Co-op Coffees turned into a major motor of um, farmer to farmer trainings and exchanges. We've brought delegations of our other partners to come see what's happening in Honduras and to know, to be able to actually touch and see what's possible has created this, I would say, it's a small revolution. Interestingly, just yesterday, I was listening to um, a sustainable investment um, forum leading up to COP26 and two different people, risk managers um, and Citibank, both ended by saying, soil is sexy. And I'm thinking, okay, it's taken me 10 years talking about soil. And, so I was, and I think finally we're turning a corner where people are starting to understand that you can't destroy the building blocks of life and expect life to thrive. So that was major and a major moment for us, for myself personally, for Co-op Coffees and many of our producers. Um, and I also see that that entire conversation about regenerative organics and soil life and has really moved from a tiny corner to um, being sort of mm, fairly significant revolution in how we're thinking about agriculture and the potential of agriculture worldwide to really be a significant climate solution. So um, very happy story and Oscar is actually doing great. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for those insights. Um, we do have one question that's come in. Um, I'll pose it to the group. But um, uh, so people are, are the question is about uh, suggestions or strategies for how to start talking about fair trade with individuals who are fo solely focused on how much things cost for them personally. Anybody, uh, anybody in the group want to jump in on that one? Zach, I feel like you faced that question quite a few times over the years. But uh, if anyone else wants to jump in on it as well. Yeah, that seems like a Zach question to me as well. I agree. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I've had, I didn't send the question in, um, but I often ask myself how you do that. Um, I've had some experiences where uh, going and talking to somebody, you know, say in the Manitoba government about uh, procuring fair trade products. And I've been warned before I go into the room that, you um, um, you know, one of the things you have to be careful of is this particular bureaucrat is really quite cranky and has a very small budget, etc. And there, there I find myself with that person. So usually, what I do is I whip out samples, and uh, so, and as people on the panel know, I am a chocoholic, a fair trade chocoholic. So I find that one way, I mean, a practical way, not a, not a great philosophical and spiritual way is to um, get people to taste really good fair trade coffee, really good uh, fair trade chocolate and realize that they're missing out. Um, one of the challenges, of course, is cost because there are people who are unable to afford um, some of those products. But, but I find too that prices are coming down, availability is increasing and people's awareness is increasing. Um, so um, particularly fair trade coffee uh, and particularly during the COVID pandemic has uh, increased in sales right through the roof, something like 20%, I think. And um, for people who are Costco shoppers, um, something like 75% of the um, coffee beans um, 
purchased in Canada right now are fair trade coffee beans or the fair trade ones are purchased at at Costco. So um, um, things are getting better. Um, hand out those samples. Um, so that's the uh, what I would call the self-interest way of pushing fair trade uh, when when you don't think altruism is going to work. I'll yeah. leave it at that. Can I jump in and just say I would I would beg to differ that it's more expensive. The question is where are the profits going? Because it's easy to compare a very high quality coffee to an extremely low quality coffee, which is what is inexpensive. If you're buying a quality coffee, the price between other scenarios, direct import or you know, different mechanisms for trade with fair trade, the price difference it's practically non-existent. So really the question is, you know, do you want to vote with your values? You know, and it's, I always feel it just tastes better when you know no one has to get hurt along the way because it is, the exploitation is unnecessary. And so I think it's a good strategy to put the product on the table, but um, I think we also need to shift the conversation and start comparing apples to apples and not, you know, bananas to cucumbers. So that's my opinion. <laughs> I wonder if I could, uh, I'd like to put Haroon on the spot. I was going to say, I don't want to put Haroon on the spot, but in reality I do. So I'll just put him on the spot. Haroon, uh, these comments make me think here about, uh, you know, the idea that it's a colonial price or it's an imperialist price. We think we should be paying for so much food. Um, I'd just love to know what you think about that. I mean, I, as I recall too, you're not a fan of too much meat. Um, are we used to a colonial diet? And like, is it decolonizing to actually pay more and think more carefully about what we eat? Well, I certainly uh, would say that that, that kind of uh, choice of words, Gavin, is it decolonizing to think about our diet? I would, I would say that's a very powerful statement that I would broadly agree with because so much of our food, especially over the past 25 years, has increasingly come over a great distance. Uh, when I was, when I was, you know, the age of my students, I mean, most food uh, that that we would eat would be sourced from within Ontario, and very, not a lot of it was going to be imported. And the sort of thing that was going to be brought from outside of Ontario would come from other parts of Canada. So imports were quite a small share of what we were eating, and of course that's been totally transformed as a as a a uh, coercively cost-conscious retail system has increasingly sought to ensure that it's making money by, make, by, by shifting high volumes of food towards us, irregardless of the, uh, of the quality that, uh, that we have. Um, so many of our tropical products that we, that we have become used to are based upon uh, either directly squeezing small-scale producers or dispossessing them so that larger scale operations can be introduced so that uh, the products can be can be shipped to us and that kind of operation is something which really um, is very consistent with a colonial mindset uh, a mindset in which you buy cheaply uh, in the in the country in which you're you're obtaining the source of whatever whatever foodstuffs you're purchasing and then you make sure that the the markups uh, by the time it gets to the consumer in the supermarket are sufficient that the more powerful actors, the more powerful corporations uh, in that in those stages from from farm to fork, um, that the more powerful corporations are the ones that are able to make sufficient money for their shareholders. Um, so I, I certainly think that thinking about our diets is is one way of thinking very carefully about uh, the extent to which we ourselves personally, uh, engage in decolonial practices. I would say that you know, in, in in relation to this question about about you know how do you engage people around fair trade, you know when 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 Monica and when Zach were were talking about it, I was quite struck by going back to the origins of this in my own personal life, which was Cafe Direct in the UK, which was one of the first brands. And it was not something, Monica, that was marketed as a premium coffee. It was marketed to compete with supermarket coffees with a price premium. 
but the reason you were able to establish a reasonable market niche for Cafe Direct, which was established, small share, but still a niche, uh, was because it simply tasted better, as, as, as you were saying. So the price was a, a little bit more than the other supermarket coffees, but um, it tasted better and people educated themselves around it. And it certainly was the case that you establish these critical masses of consumers. And that doesn't have to mean everyone knows what fair trade is. But certainly it's the case that um, once you reach a critical mass, which differs, differs by, by country, um, people start to self-educate about what it is that's in front of them. And so you get a situation where, you know, in the United Kingdom, you know, most bananas that are sold are fair trade bananas. They're not, they're not commercially sold bananas, they're fair trade. Um, and it certainly is the case that uh, in Northern Europe, fair trade coffee has a much more significant share of the market than it would have, say, in Canada. Because for many consumers, particularly those under the age of 40, it's sort of the default. You would ask for that first rather than, you know, just asking for your cup of coffee. But that also extends to other, other practices. So again, I mean, in the United Kingdom, it's almost impossible to buy uh eggs which are factory farmed they're almost all free range eggs now and it's just because of critical mass of consumer education around the terms and conditions by which something is being produced and that really does require advocates going out and talking to people and that's not talking to people in in the big meetings you know it's talking to people in the supermarkets i mean when i go to the supermarket i talk to people i say to them when they're picking up the particular brand of berry i say you know, you shouldn't buy that because their labor practices are atrocious. And they look at me and say, what? And I say, yeah, their labor practices are atrocious. And they say, what do you mean? And I start talking to them. And you get into these really interesting conversations. And it should also be said that very often when I go into the supermarket and I see where things are, I tweet to Loblaws about how crappy what they're doing is. And they completely ignore it. You know, so there is a way of challenging you know, some of the underlying narratives through our everyday practices. But, and Gavin knows I believe this very, very strongly, changing our everyday practices is really, really important. But it's not changing our everyday practices that are going to bring trade justice and a more equitable world to the marginalized uh, that live on the, on the perimeter of the global agri-food economy. It's going to have to be much more structural changes in trade relations so that people receive as you were saying in your introductory remarks, Gavin, a fair price for what it is they're producing, a price which reflects their cost of living and what they should aspire to. You know, when we had these managed international trade arrangements, which really collapsed in the late 1980s, the fact of the matter was that in the 60s and the 70s and the, you know, small scale farmers in many parts of the world could aspire to send their one of their kids to university because of these managed trade arrangements, they can't do that anymore. You know, we have undermined their livelihoods through the actions of our governments, and it's up to us to get our governments to, to, to reverse that. Wonderful. And maybe uh, maybe as a follow-up uh, on the trade front, maybe back to you, Haroon, or uh, maybe you, Gavin, as well. Um, I mean, do, do, do people feel optimistic? Uh, like, is there, are we on the right track? Is there, is there a chance for change? I mean, you're seeing uh, stronger voices from some of the smaller countries in the world around climate, uh, which is great to see. Uh, you are seeing uh, labor practices and other, other items being put into trade agreements. They don't necessarily carry a lot of weight yet, but they are entering into some of the new agreements like the new NAFTA. Um, so it's just kind of a, a broad, a broad question to the group. Uh, if people are optimistic for the future of trade relations. I think uh, before I'll jump in before Gavin, because uh, I always like to do that. <laughs> um, I do think that if we go back to what uh, Monica was, was saying, if you want to be optimistic about the future of trade, your optimism has to come through the terms and conditions by which the climate emergency is addressed because the addressing of the climate emergency has to take into account a global trade regime which systematically contributes to that climate emergency. And I do think that we have, you know, 
uh, myriad examples of much more managed trade relations designed to promote uh, uh, employment and, and good living standards. Um, and those sorts of managed trade relationships can incorporate a climate justice perspective uh, in a way which would then re lead to quite systematic renegotiation. Um, the problem is, is that getting to that point is going to be for advocates and for activists, a, a, a monumental struggle because of the vested interests that exist. Uh, <coughs> and that's where one could be pessimistic because those same vested interests are the ones that benefit from the climate emergency. I do think we're coming towards a tipping point in which either we resolve things or things cascade over the edge. I'm not sure what will happen there. Yeah, I mean, I'm only going to add to that, I think, because uh, there are lots of negatives in this world. But I'll tell you, there's some positive signs. And I'll quickly throw in two that come to my mind. One is just this morning I was reading a report that was assembled by the FTAO, as well as uh, Tradecraft and Industrial. So the unions are working together with fair trade groups, writing a report, uh, advancing new policies that Europe should be adopting so that they're more fair in the way they treat garment workers in uh, throughout the Global South. Uh, it might have had an emphasis on Bangladesh. But, uh, and so I think that there is this growing sense of fair trade expanding, building its connections, growing Southern voice, uh, working with different types of partners and advocating uh, for the kinds of uh, system change that we ultimately need. That'd be one positive. And the other positive is that I think, I don't know where this will lead, but I think it is true that after, after decades of tokenism, when it came to things like labor and then the environment and trade agreements, there's a bit of a shift right now. And the one I see is in the new NAFTA, where there's this rapid response labor mechanism now. And it's so far been tested a couple times, and it's doing some pretty interesting stuff. So in, uh, at a very, very large GM factory in uh, Guanajuato in Mexico, um, uh, there's basically a um, protection union there, which is a, a word for a union that's basically imposed on the workers that the workers never democratically chose. And uh, the workers rebelled and said that uh, their, their union wasn't letting them have a free vote. And it, uh, the word got back to the US, and the labor movement put pressure on the Biden administration. They triggered the rapid response labor mechanism. Um, the original vote was, uh, was uh, well, they called for a new vote. They called for a new vote with uh, labor inspectors from the ILO and all this stuff. This has all happened in the last few months. And then with the new vote, the protection union was defeated. And now those workers at that factory will get to create an independent union. This has all happened in the last, say, six months. Hmm. So I think that there are some interesting signs that the more people push back in multiple ways, uh, that there are some indications that things could change. I'd also add to that, uh, Gavin, to that, that there's actually, there's also, in my view, a third reason to be, to be optimistic, and that is that there are international institutions with which, you know, trade justice advocates can very strongly ally themselves with. I mean, if you look at the the ongoing policy work of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, it is tremendously progressive. Uh, they've been advocating for a trade-based Green New Deal uh, for the better part of four years. Um, and also within the International Labour Organization, the idea around social protection floors and, and living wages is embedded within within the DNA you know, of those, of that organization. So there are international organizations which will take the, the claims of global civil society, I think, very, very uh, strongly because they're very supportive of it. So, and, and that's interesting because we may not have allies at the level of the nation state, but there are allies beyond the level of the nation state that are doing good things to support the kind of work that's being done. Wonderful. So we are at time. Um, so I don't know if we have any uh, last uh, statements or uh, any closing remarks. Um, I did have a question sent to me, but I guess we should probably wrap things up, eh? Oh, I think we could squeeze one more in. All right. Well, actually, then it's, I think you should answer this one, Sean. Oh. So I actually had a, a question <laughs> uh, emailed to me from a very close friend. Um, and uh, she's having a hard time with the chat function. So she wants to ask, what kind of lobby pressure are you trying to exert on the Canadian government to take the issues you've presented into account? So I wonder if you could speak for, for the CFTN or for Fair Trade in Canada on that issue. It sounds like a perfect question for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I will say, uh, 
kind of larger advocacy work has been something we have wanted to do for a very long time. We're sometimes uh, limited in capacity in what we're able to do. Uh, I think the the focus over the past couple of years has been on um, the Modern Slavery Act um, or human rights due diligence work. That's kind of been the focus over the past couple of years. And that's been trying to hold companies to account and on how they source. Um, so that that has been kind of the, the feature uh, policy uh, legislative push over the past couple of years. So that, that's kind of the that's the main one. So. Yeah. We could send uh, one of these to every MP. <laughs> we need um, we need somebody to cover the cost. <laughs> if there are any volunteers in the audience. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I wonder if then uh, uh, we should wrap things up. I don't know if anybody else has anything to say at the end, but I would just like to reiterate again. What a wonderful group of contributors it's been working with. What a wonderful panel this has been as well. Um, it has been a bit of a journey uh, with so many contributors. And I think the final product is really a wonderful product that I, I myself can't wait to use in my class and in other ways. And, and congratulations to everybody involved in the book. It's been a real pleasure working with uh, Zach and Sean, by the way. What a wonderful team we have. Uh, so congratulations to everybody. Wonderful. Thanks, everyone. This has Thanks, been fantastic, everyone. and it's been a pleasure working with all of you. And it certainly thank has. You. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. And thank thanks to everyone. Likewise, it's been an honor. Thank you very much. <laughs>